Good morning and welcome to the fall commencement ceremonies of Baylor University School of Law. We have a great day of celebration and memory before us as we bring these graduates into the profession. May Mayan Elowat, who has been selected by the class to deliver the invocation, has been delayed. But we have to go ahead, but not without prayer. And so I am calling upon uh, Dean Patricia Wilson, Pat Wilson, to deliver the invocation. Dean Wilson. Good morning. Please bow and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the beauty of this day. Not just the cool, crisp weather that reminds us of the seasons and the seasons of life, but also for the beauty of this celebration, the joy of this day of celebration. We thank you for these graduates. We thank you for their families and friends that have supported them along the way. As they embark on the next phase of their lives, may you bless the work that they do. May they feel your presence. May they feel your guidance. Help them to do the good work that they have been trained to do. We thank you for everything, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you, Dean Wilson. Uh, graduates, please be seated. Uh, once again, welcome to our fall commencement ceremony of Baylor University School of Law. Uh, commencement days are among my very favorite days because they really are a marker point in which we send our graduates into the profession and further into their adult life, now equipped to be true servants. And there is a powerful theme of service that runs through everything that we do at Baylor Law School. The graduates this morning have accomplished a lot. Uh, they have, of course, come to this point, many of them with 19, 20 or more years of education. I'm sure that you have all heard tales of woe over the phone and email and text about what they have endured over the past three years at Baylor Law School. Uh, we put a lot of fire underneath of our students because we are expecting them to be fully prepared to represent their clients in the future. And their clients will be coming to them with problems that will be, in so many instances, the most important problem they have had in their life. And they need to be prepared, and hence, we put them through a very rigorous course of study. But they have not arrived here by themselves. Class, uh, you have arrived here because you have been loved, you have been nurtured and cared for ever since you drew your first breath. And that love and care has been given to you by so many within your family, your mother, your father, your grandparents, aunts, uncles, siblings, spouses, partners, children, they have made it possible for you to arrive at this point. They have supported you. No one gets here by their own self or by their own work. And hence, because this is a day of celebration for families as well as, of course, for the graduates, uh, graduates, uh, stand up, turn around, and let's express appreciation to those who are responsible for bringing you here. We indeed have a program at Baylor Law School that uh, has been summarized over the years in, in this fashion. Uh, Baylor Law School, their t-shirts and the like, is referred to as where fun goes to die. And uh, we, uh, we think that is appropriate. The graduates have not had much fun over the past three years. But as I have indicated, they have arrived at this point uh, because we have invested them with the gifts and the training and the education and the skills that they need to make it happen for their clients and for those whom they will serve in the future. Uh, Marion Wright Edelman, the founder of the Children's Defense Fund, I think put it so aptly when she said that service, service is the rent that we pay for our lives. It's not something that there's an option to do. We are here, as I, from the very point of orientation of these students, you'll remember students, I have told you that you're here for what reason? 
the vertical, this is to honor God and his kingdom, and the horizontal, to serve those in the kingdom, the vertical and the horizontal dimensions of life. You will go forward knowing your purpose in life. You already have, but now you have those special skills. I want to, uh, this morning, uh, point out a nexus between <clears throat> the legal profession and the armed forces. It may seem peculiar to you. And I'm not doing this because of Veterans Day on the 11th. I'm doing it, I've done it at every graduation for as far back as I can remember. Think about the legal profession. Class you as lawyers, as Baylor lawyers, remember capital B, capital L, why? It's not just a descriptor, it's a brand. As Baylor lawyers, you will join the legal profession and you will be guardians of the rule of law and our system of justice. In the legal profession, we would not be able to fulfill our obligations as the guardians of the rule of law were it not for those who have served in the armed forces, who are serving in the armed forces, not just across the nation, but as we all know, around the entire globe. The armed forces provide for us the umbrella of security that allows us in the legal profession to tend to those obligations that we have to the legal system. And so, I would like everyone who is active, reserve, retired, who has served in the armed forces or is currently serving, to please stand up and receive our appreciation. See, we live in a culture and a society in which there are many false heroes. Uh, we encounter false heroes every day in the media. The real heroes are those who have just stood for our appreciation and recognition. You all rock. You rock. On the stage this morning, I am joined by my colleagues. You have in the commencement program uh, rather lengthy uh, biographies of each of the uh, faculty participants in the ceremonies this morning, so I'm not going to dwell upon detail, but I am going to call out each of them and uh, just share with you some, some broad observations. First of all, uh, hooding our graduates this morning, uh, Professor Rory Ryan. Professor Ryan, please raise your hand. All right, and also hooding our graduates this morning, Professor Luke Meyer. Uh, both these are really smart guys. Uh, both of them work in areas uh, regarding federal jurisdiction uh, and the like, and uh, they are each veterans upon our uh, faculty. Uh, they teach these students at the outset, and then they also encounter them later on in their work at the law school. Uh, I so appreciate each of you as you have invested yourselves in molding each of these graduates to go forward. Thank you so much, and it's a real tribute to you that uh, you have been selected by the graduating class to honor them through the hooding of each of them. And then, to this side, I will introduce Professor Matt Corden, our speaker, in just a moment. Uh, we have Associate Dean Pat Wilson. Pat? has just delivered our invitation. Uh, Pat has just become our associate dean, but she is no newcomer to Baylor Law School. She has been on the Baylor Law School faculty for 29 years, and uh, she is uniformly respected and admired by my colleagues, and it has been a real joy since this summer of working with her more closely. Uh, Professor Leah Teague, Associate Dean Leah Teague, and I worked together for just shy of 30 years and uh, Dean Teague decided time to, uh, or another chapter, so she has returned to the faculty full time. And we have now, doing the duties that were done by uh, Associate Dean Teague, Pat Wilson and Angela Cruz Turner, who is our senior assistant dean. What happens each day in 
the classrooms and the courtrooms at Baylor Law School happens because of our faculty and staff colleagues. And I want to also emphasize here, I always recognize staff colleagues because these students know in so many ways our staff colleagues make the law school go day by day. I want to use this opportunity not only to have introduced those who are on stage with us, but I want all the faculty and staff colleagues and they're spread around to please stand and receive our appreciation. <laughs> Baylor Law School is the success that it is because we have dedicated colleagues who are invested in our mission. They understand our values. They understand our norms. They know what we are seeking to accomplish with our graduates and how it should be done. I want to now call upon the highest ranking student in the class, uh, Christina Marie Vargas. Uh, Christina, if you might share some observations on behalf of your class. Thank you, Dean Tobin, and thank you to our family, friends, professors, and law school staff for your support in getting us here today. Did you ever call your graduate while they were in law school and ask them, how many years do you have left? When are you going to graduate? And at least for me, the answer usually started with a sigh, a well, and then this long-winded explanation about the quarter system and my place in it. It was just as confusing for us to explain to you as it probably was for you to understand. Personally, though, I loved the quarter system. One reason is because we had the opportunity to have classes with everyone throughout their law school experience rather than just sticking with the same group the whole time. So my very first quarter, I got to have classes with people who were the quarter above me. Um, I remember talking to them and getting their advice and just thinking so highly of them because they had already survived a whole quarter of law school. And as for the practice court students who were walking in the halls with their carts and in their suits, I could gush about them for hours about how amazing I thought they were. But I found that I didn't regard myself the same way I did others after I accomplished the same feats they did. I came, after my first quarter, I came home feeling absolutely defeated. And fast forward to practice court, um, in the middle of my big trial, which is basically our capstone mock trial exercise, I remember turning to my partner and telling her that I was ready to voluntarily fail myself because I didn't feel worthy of passing. So thanks to a quick internet search, it wasn't hard to self-diagnose myself with a condition called imposter syndrome. It's defined as feelings of self-doubt and personal incompetence that persist despite your education, experiences, and accomplishments. Does this sound familiar to anyone? Maybe it doesn't, and if so, that's great. But most surprisingly, I saw a lot of imposter syndrome during my last quarter here. So at this point, we only had about 15 hours left in our 126 hour degree, and we had all survived practice court. Yet, I found, a, I found myself hearing a lot of self-doubt from my friends. So I may not be able to give you the um, cure for imposter syndrome, but what I can do is remind you of some of the things we've accomplished thus far, so when you're feeling down on yourself, you can reflect back and see how far you've come. So let's rewind back to our first year. We were spending multiple hours a day reading and rereading cases, having to brief them, just to go to class and have our professors tell us that we were completely wrong. We had to learn how to stand up in front of the entire class, if we were lucky sometimes, for a full hour and 10 minutes, and be able to recite the facts to cases like Penoyer and Paul's graph that were very difficult. And then at the end of the year, we were required to compete in a 1L moot court competition against each other. This basically was us having to argue a legal issue in front of a judge. Do y'all remember comment K? And it was an issue that honestly, I'm not sure if I totally comprehended. But I made it through, we all did. And I found myself having a little bit of fun and the place for fun goes to die. We got a small taste of what practice court would be like during our second year when we took trust in estates and business organizations. In those classes, we were having to attend every day, sometimes read up to 20 cases a day, and create 100-page outlines by the end of the quarter. And in our electives, we 
had to learn how to pull information back from our 1L classes, because as we learned, the law can't always be compartmentalized into one subject. And then came the infamous practice court. It was everything I had heard it was gonna be, and so, so much more. And although I didn't come out of it as the expert I thought I'd be when I saw those practice court students in the hallway my first year, I did come out of it at least a little bit smarter. Sure, I may not be able to try a winning case on my own, but at least I have a good idea of where to start. I've always liked the song Humble and Kind by Tim McGraw. The premise of the song is essentially to reach for the stars and whenever you get there, always stay humble and kind. But what I also take away from the song is to remember your roots and where you came from. As Tim says, when you get where you're going, don't forget to turn back around. So maybe some of these memories I shared with you today don't seem like such a big deal anymore, but I can promise you they were when they were experiencing them. When you're feeling like you're not enough, I want you to remember law school and where you started and how much you've grown. Know that the mistakes and fumbles you'll make along the way aren't signs of weaknesses, but are your biggest moments of growth and learning. As our professors have always told us, you're never gonna remember your wins, but you're always gonna learn from your losses. Before starting law school, I had a lawyer tell me that the people in law school will quickly become your close friends because you all share the common bond of suffering together. And that could not be more than true. My absolute favorite part about going to Baylor Law was the people. I loved being able to walk in the building, see a familiar face right away, and be able to strike up a conversation with them. Everyone sitting here today has been one of those people to me, as well as my friends who have already graduated and are still finishing up. You have all impacted me in more ways than I know, than you may know, and I will forever be grateful for you. Congratulations, Baylor lawyers. Christina, thank you for those insightful remarks. Uh, you are not an imposter. All of you, this class, you're not imposters. You're now going to be Baylor lawyers. You have everything that it takes. And just remember that. You came through Baylor Law School. You were tested, and you proved yourself worthy. And also, Christina, uh, very insightful to note that you will find, as you already have, that uh, some of your very best friendships that you have developed in the law school program here will endure down through the years, through the decades. Almost every Baylor lawyer will tell you that they have close Baylor lawyer friends. In fact, we're a small school. We're one of the smallest law schools in the nation. We are certainly the smallest in Texas. and. Uh, it is often noted that uh, Baylor lawyers have what is referred to as the Baylor Lawyer Mafia Connect uh, because we do stick together. We stick together. We do not let geography or time come between or among us. Thank you, Christina. It's my delight now to introduce to you Professor Matt Corden as the speaker. Uh, Professor Corden, uh, as is the case with Professor Ryan and Professor Meyer, has been chosen by the class to deliver remarks. Professor Corden uh, is a longtime faculty member at the law school. He is also the director of our Legal Writing Center. We have six full-time faculty that are dedicated over to doing nothing but working with our students throughout the entire, <coughs> excuse me, throughout the entire three-year program to sharpen their ability to write to various audiences and for various purposes. Professor Corden is a workhorse. He, in his teaching, has been awarded uh, outstanding uh, honor by the university. Each year, the university recognizes a very small handful of faculty for achievement in teaching or in scholarship, and I'll note that both Professor Ryan and Professor Meyer have won those awards. Professor Corden has won it both for teaching and for scholarship. Uh, he is an absolute workhorse with our students. It is not unusual if you come into the Law Center and go to the Writing Center on a weekend to find that Professor Corden is working with our students. He is an absolute blessing to Baylor Law School and to our program. Professor Corden is published in the area of writing. 
Uh, he is uh, widely recognized in the law school circles throughout the nation for his expertise in what he does with our students and the effectiveness of his work. He is very mild-mannered. Uh, Professor Corden, I'm sure all the students will agree, uh, is capable of the most dry wit that can almost fly over your head unless you're really tuned in to what he is saying. He is also a big sports fan. Uh, he actually, after college, in college and after college, before law school, was a sports writer. And uh, he can regale with all manner of stats and recollections of the great games, whether it be football, baseball, or whatever. But perhaps most important in terms of your personal safety when you're dealing with him is he has won international and national awards championships in jiu-jitsu, a form, a Brazilian form of grappling. And so you don't mess with Professor Corden, even though he is mild-mannered. Uh, he and his wife Jennifer have two children, Madison and Chandler. And class, you have made a wonderful decision uh, this morning to have Professor Corden uh, speak to you at this juncture as you go forth into the profession. Professor Corden. Thank you, Dean Tobin, for that introduction. Uh, Deans Wilson and Cruz Turner, my colleagues at Baylor Law, members of the graduating class and their families and friends. The first time a graduating class invited me to speak at a graduation occurred nearly 20 years ago. We were still experiencing the aftermath of the September 11th attacks, <clears throat> an event that changed our world forever. Until the pandemic of the past 20 months, it is fair to say that no other event in my lifetime came close to reshaping how we think about the world. The commencement speaker during that graduation was Professor Jerry Powell, who, as most of you know, recently retired after 35 years of teaching at Baylor Law. The graduates to whom he spoke had experienced an event that changed the profession in which they would enter. He told the class, you can no longer focus just on yourself, on your career, or even on just your own family. More will be asked of you. As Americans, and especially as lawyers, you will carry with you great responsibilities. After September 11th, each of you must be willing to stand guard over our liberty, to serve your country selflessly, and if the need arises, to be a hero. It was the best speech I had ever heard. In my mind, I could only think of the word poignant. My mind could never forget it. Meanwhile, I was one of the two faculty members asked to hood the graduates that day. Today, that honor goes to Professors Ryan and Meyer. I do not think I knew what an honor it was to, for a class to elect me to serve in that role, to be asked to be part of such a memorable day in the lives of those graduates. I figured it was because I suffer from a syndrome known as can't say no. I also suffer from imposter syndrome, but that's for a different speech. When you hood the graduates, I don't remember anybody telling me what you're supposed to do. So all I remember was Professor Gwynn saying, Matt, you just go over there and get those hoods ready and I'll take care of the rest of it, which would have been great, except he didn't take care of the rest of it. So what you're gonna find out is that hooding graduates is something like lassoing, but I don't know how to use a lasso. And it's also sort of like throwing a blanket over a bed but I've been married 22 years, and my wife will tell you, I still can't make a bed. So as I was listening to the greatest speech I had ever heard, and as I was simultaneously trying to figure out how I was going to throw the hoods over the graduates' heads without choking them or otherwise just messing up the entire ceremony, I was thankful to know that no graduating class would ever elect me to serve as a speaker. If I'm incompetent at hooding, you don't want me speaking. And here I am. Okay. But think about it. Professor Gerald R. Powell is a legend in every sense of the word, a foremost expert on the law of evidence, a master teacher, literally by title. When he speaks, you listen. 
And if you heard even some of the comments made about him when he received the Baylor Lawyer of the Year Award three weeks ago, you would know that his students are never going to forget what he taught them. I teach grammar with an emphasis on helping students or insisting that students avoid passive voice. Do you want me to read from the Chicago Manual style? And as for me delivering an unforgettable speech, I have spoken at 37 new student orientations, during which time I have repeated the saga of Phoebe Mills, the 1988 Olympic gymnast who returned to her high school and became a junior varsity diver. The message has been that when you transition from a successful background to something new, you must adapt. In many ways, you must start over. Now, I can ask you if you remember the story of Phoebe Mills, and you might nod poli politely yes. The answer is no, you don't. Nobody remembers me telling the story of Phoebe Mills. Whatever the opposite of poignant is, that is every speech that I ever give. So when I speak, you hear a bunch of mumbling, and you can't believe that the class period still has 62 minutes to go. But here I am, needing to overcome my shortcomings and say something that you will remember to a class that does not remember me telling them the first thing I ever taught them. And the Phoebe Mills story happens to be the most interesting story that I tell. Well, it turns out we can define poignant in different ways. I pulled out my trusted dictionary and looked up the word. Poignant is an adjective and is defined as profoundly moving or touching, which is not helpful. I cannot move you to care that passive voice occurs when you use a be verb in a past participle. But let's continue to look at the word poignant. It also means physically painful, which could have applied if you had elected me to hood you. <laughs> but most pertinent, it means also keenly distressing to the mind or feelings. Keenly distressing to the mind or feelings. Reminding you of legal analysis, research, and communications alone may be keenly distressing to your mind and feelings such that I can satisfy the definition of the word poignant. But I can do better than that. I teach grammar. None of you may remember the story of Phoebe Mills, but I bet every one of you remembers other distressing points in Lark. So yes, I'm going to read to you from the Chicago Manual of Style. Let's learn about joint and separate genitives. Notice I did not say joint and several. This is grammar, not remedies. And I quote, if two or more nouns share possession, the last noun takes the genitive ending. This is called joint or group possession. For example, Peter and Harriet's correspondence refers to the correspondence between Peter and Harriet. If two or more nouns possess something separately, each noun takes its own genitive ending. For example, Peter's and Harriet's correspondence refers to Peter's correspondence and also to Harriet's correspondence, presumably with all sorts of people. So to put this principle into practice, Ashley's and Christina's families are wondering why on earth this fool has been asked to speak to the graduating class. <laughs> you see, we are referring to Ashley's family and also to Christina's family, wondering why this fool is speaking to the graduating class. Presumably, all sorts of people are wondering the same thing. But most importantly, I ask that you feel keenly distressed to your mind and feelings. Poignant. As was the case with the graduating class to whom Professor Powell spoke in 2002, the world has changed since you began your law school career, in many ways irrevocably. I don't need to tell you or anyone else here what the pandemic has been like or how it has changed everything. It's sometimes hard to know what's normal anymore. In writing a speech like this one, it's hard to know what's funny anymore. An event like 9-11 brought about the best in people and brought about the worst in people. In my view, I think the pandemic has managed to bring out the worst in people. We don't communicate with one another the same way. We don't relate to one another the same way. The last 20 months has caused further erosion in the trust we have in one another. I would like to believe that the pandemic could have brought out the best in people. I would like to deliver a speech that talks about heroes. That is what Professor Powell did nearly 20 years ago. 
And to be sure, I think there have been many unsung heroes during this pandemic, including those in our very community. Those in the medical profession have been heroes. Those in the related public health sector have been heroes. Those who keep our critical, critical infrastructure intact, including those in information technology, have been unsung heroes. But we don't hear about them. Or if we do, we don't celebrate them as heroes or anything close to heroes. Our lawyers among those who have been heroes. As lawyers, could we be among the heroes? As we rebuild society now that this pandemic seems to be coming to an end, what role can lawyers play? I would not suggest that lawyers are going to be heroes as advocates in this context. I would, however, say that lawyers possess unique problem-solving skills that would allow them to solve problems that others cannot seem to solve. Lawyers should be able to look at arguments objectively without getting so wrapped up in their personal opinions that they cannot find room to compromise. In other words, lawyers have unique skills that allow them to lead in ways that others might not. I am certainly not one of those heroes, but I served in a leadership capacity during the past many months, and I've, during that time I've heard plenty of logical arguments and plenty of illogical arguments. If I've been able to bring anything to the table, it's the fundamental lawyering ability to consider arguments rationally and objectively that has helped me the most and I do not possess what Baylor lawyers possess. I can only wish I had the training you have had. I realize you may not want to hear how lucky you were to complete the program you have, but I envy you. I have done nothing in my career that you could not also do, and you have the potential to do so much more. My immediate concerns for the eight of you, though, do not really focus on what we expect you to do as lawyers. My concerns focus on how we have taught you over the past 20 months. We take pride in our ability to train students. We take pride in training each and every one of you. We know that this law school cannot succeed unless every one of you succeeds. That may put pressure on you, but it puts even greater pressure on us. During the past 20 months, I am concerned that you became anonymous. You became a box on Zoom. Sure, we might have seen your cat run in front, of your in front of your camera, or we might have seen the kitchen of your apartment or house when we never would have otherwise, but Zoom is not a medium that lets us get to know you. It is instead a medium that lets us notify you that you're still muted. Sure, we returned to the classroom a year ago, but with the exception of a few months last summer, you were in classes where all we could see were eyes and foreheads and nothing else but masks. I have taught every current student in this law school, but unfortunately I could not tell you what half of those students even look like. Most regrettably, I do not believe I've truly gotten to know them. What I want you to know though is that you were never anonymous. We may not have always been nice to you, even before the pandemic and something else I probably did not need to remind you of, but we were always committed to you. Let me try to prove that to you. I have always aimed to learn something about each and every student who has matriculated at our law school. Learning something may be through observations in the classroom or it may be due to something I asked in conferences. In the more recent past, our admissions office has prepared blurbs about each of our new students, allowing us to read what is most important to those entering our program. So two or more years ago, what did I learn about you? Bailey Bryson came to B Baylor from California and she expressed her love for physical fitness and CrossFit. She was also one of the top five presenters in environmental policies at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Ashley Coughlin was also from California, working at a mental wellness center and volunteering for an Alzheimer's association. Her goal was to combine her passion for mental health and criminal justice. Alyssa Collinsworth-Stewart came to law school, quote, determined to become a lawyer to empower and to be empowered by those with stories that need to be told. At the time she entered law school, her husband, Dakota, was stationed at Fort Hood. He has since returned to civilian life and now trains grappling at the same place where I train, and I can assure you he wreaks havoc on the entire academy. Mayan Eliwat is from Amman, Jordan, and is a long-suffering fan of the Cleveland Browns, and we're glad you came. <laughs> We've witnessed few students who have been able to persevere the way that Mayan has, no matter what obstacles have stood in his way. 
Macy Gilbert came to law school with service-oriented goals, saying, quote, justice is not universally defined. In order to advocate for others, first we must understand their mindset as well as the oppositions. Fizik Khan owned a music business and speaks five languages. She said, quote, a music teacher, much like a lawyer, takes what is written and inanimate, transforms it by perceiving it, playing it, and thus humanizing it, ultimately making it accessible to others with the goal of help as the focal point. Israel Medina was a first-generation college student when he attended and graduated from the University of North Texas. He was recently part of a national pretrial competition team that advanced to the final round. And Christina Vargas completed an internship before law school at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Fort Worth and expressed her desire to be a business lawyer. Even with her interest in transactional practice, she knew the advocacy training would help her. Not one of you was just some nameless law student or now law graduate. Each one of you came, into, came to law school aiming to make a difference. We trained each one of you to allow you to achieve your goals. Please never forget the person you were before you got here, and please never think that we did not care about you as an individual. Go become, go become among the lawyers we so desperately need. Go become the advocate you wanted to be. I meant leaders you most desperately need. We don't need more lawyers. But, um, go become the advocate you wanted to be when we arrived here. Go seek justice and go empower others. And if I can say one more thing, you might just remember. Passive voice occurs when you join a B verb and a past participle. If you can insert the phrase by zombies after your verb and your sentence still makes sense, you've written your sentence in passive voice. For example, we were taught by zombies. Passive voice, avoid it. Thank you for letting me be a part of your day today. May God bless each of you. Can you see now how disarming Professor Corden is? Kind of winds up with the humor and then delivers the punch, the message about your training and your preparation. Matt, you, you noted that you don't have the training of a Baylor lawyer. I think someone who has worked oftentimes six or seven days a week for over two decades qualifies to say that they have the training of a Baylor lawyer because you have infused it into generations, so to say, of Baylor lawyers. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for that message. We have come now to the time for the presentation of the class and the award of the degrees. I call upon Dean Wilson uh, to present the class. Dean Wilson. Abraham Lincoln is quoted as saying, the best way to predict your future is to create it. These graduates have worked hard to earn this degree that opens the door to their creating their future. Congratulations. Dean Tobin, each of these candidates before you have completed the requirements for the de degree of Juris Doctor as prescribed by the faculty of the School of Law and by Baylor University acting through the authority of the Board of Regents. It is my pleasure to present the class to you for the conferral of the degree. Thank you, Dean Wilson. Will the degree candidates please stand? Each of you have completed the requirements for the degree of Juris Doctor as prescribed by the faculty of the law school and as authorized by the Board of Regents of Baylor University. Accordingly, it's my pleasure on behalf of the Board of Regents of Baylor University and President Linda Livingstone to confer upon you the degree of Juris Doctor. We will now go forth with the award of the diplomas and the hooding of each of our graduates. Friends, 
We're here in a beautiful sanctuary. It's hard to believe it's a Baptist church, actually. You may feel some reticence about celebrating your graduate as he or she comes across the stage. Please don't. Uh, we have a long tradition at Baylor Law School. It involves asking the families and friends to make as much noise as possible when the name of their graduate is called out. Don't be shy and be aware also that we measure the depth of the love you have <laughs> for your graduate by the decibels that you can produce. And with that, let us go forward. Bailey Ann Bryson. Ashley Clarice Coughlin. Alyssa Marie Collinsworth Stewart. Mayan Hisham Eliwat. Macy Elise Gilbert. Fizza Aisha Khan. Israel Ruiz Medina.
Christina Marie Vargas, highest ranking student in the graduating class. Well, first of all, family and friends, I was listening. You all did a great job. <laughs> Give yourself some applause as we also applaud our graduates. <laughs> graduates, uh, as uh, Professor Corden has uh, shared poignantly, poignantly uh, you are going forward into the profession. You're fully equipped. You're fully equipped. Uh, you are Baylor lawyers, as I am always to say and have said already, uh, capital B, capital L, when you type it or print it, because it's not just a descriptor, it's a brand. It's a highly distinctive, if not unique, brand. Remember that you are here to serve. Uh, you have been given, will be given by the state of Texas or wherever you are admitted to the bar. Uh, you will be given a remarkable privilege in our nation and in our society and culture. And of course, you are well aware that when you are given a privilege, along with it always comes an obligation. And we're looking forward as we will see you down through the years as you make an impact upon your families, your communities, your churches, your synagogues, the larger public square, and even our nation. We're so proud of you. Uh, you have earned what you have received today, and now we're sending you forward to serve. The 18th century cleric, Anglican cleric, John Wesley, observed to his congregation, do all the good that you can do in all the ways that you can, by all the means that you can, in all the places that you can, at all the times you can, for as long as you can. And we're sending you forward with that directive. We're so proud of you. Today, this uh, ceremony of memory and celebration has come to us because of the work of several of our colleagues. I want to thank uh, our registrar, Jerry Cunningham, uh, Susie Daniel, Nick Texera, our photographer, and then we have student workers, Jill Stewart, Madison Kovac, uh, Mari Sanchez, and Kendall Smith. Uh, they are all part of the process that goes forward in the weeks prior to commencement to bring everybody together for a point of celebration and memory. And now we're going to adjourn in a moment. Professor Corden, thank you for pointing out uh, something that has been a reality uh, with this class, and that is Zoom, COVID, and the pandemic. Uh, we are a small law school, and we prize the relationships that we develop with students, and I believe that my faculty and staff colleagues have, uh, if you will, played a remarkable hand. You, you play the hand that you're dealt. And I want to give a closing tribute to my faculty and staff colleagues for doing one whale of a great job, along with each of you, because everyone during the course of your time at Baylor Law School, everyone has been dealing with with difficulties, and uh, this too will pass. This too will pass, but uh, I admire each of you for how you soldiered through those months and months in which we were largely restricted to Zoom. I'm glad you have your mask off right now. Wear your mask, wear your mask, but I'm glad you have it off right now because we can see your smiling faces. And with that, let's go ahead and with your family and friends celebrate today. Now, before we do that though, we're going to adjourn here in a moment. 
I want to thank Emily Monk for the beautiful cello music. Thank you, Emily. And, and we will proceed out of the sanctuary, but please stay in your place because we will then come right back in from the narthex and we will have a class photo here taken at the front of the sanctuary. So with that, God bless and we are adjourned. <laughs>